Well, if this is your first time joining us, whether it be in person or online, for the past couple of months, we've been going over a series called One Another. And we've been dissecting what it looks like as Christians, how we should treat one another. So some of those topics that we've covered include what it looks like to honor one another, what does it look like to forgive, to teach, to encourage, to pray for, to serve. Um, And last week, Pastor Joe talked about what it looks like to carry each other's burdens and how as believers who are plugged into the body of Christ, we should never feel like we're alone when we're going through problems or issues, and we should walk alongside each other to help carry each other's burdens. And so if you're interested in any of those things, everything is available via the app. We have it archived. Feel free to go through the weeks and follow along with us. Well, today I have the privilege of sharing God's word. I also have the privilege of closing out the One Another series. So today's actually going to be the last day, the last part of the series, and it's a pretty interesting one. So growing up, I heard this term a lot. You know, the term we're going to be covering today is called harmony. And I remember my dad growing up, he read a lot of like Eastern philosophy books. So I heard that term a lot, but I never really fully understood it as a kid. Like, what does harmony mean? And I think I maybe had three definitions that I I came up with. For a season, I thought harmony meant, oh, in a family, if you never have any arguments or if you never have disagreements, then that must be harmony. And I was like, no, that doesn't sound right. Then eventually I thought, okay, so harmony, does that mean that everyone is just doing their own thing in their own individual silos, marching toward a similar goal without really talking to each other? Is that harmony? I was like, ah, doesn't really sound right either. And then for a season I thought, okay, harmony must mean that multiple people with different gifts comes together to form a bigger gift. And it was probably perpetuated by a cartoon that I watched as a kid. If you grew up in the 90s, you probably heard of this cartoon, okay? It was just a big commercial for recycling. And uh, essentially, there were five teenagers who had powers, like earth, wind, fire, heart, earth, something like that. And they would go through issues, there, the, there'd be tension in the story, and then all of a sudden, they need some super power to come through, and they would summon this guy named Captain Planet, okay? So it was just a big, um, you know, recycling commercial. And so growing up, I was like, okay, is that harmony? That kind of sounds like harmony. But I think as I got older... I started to understand what harmony was, and it wasn't through the form of trying to define it. It was actually by witnessing what disharmony looked like. And I remember distinctively when it kind of hit its uh, peak. So I went to a church. I didn't grow up in a church, but I went to a church when I was in high school, and I thought, wow, this place is amazing. You know, as a non-believer, I'm coming in here. People are welcoming me. All different subgroups of people are like interacting together. Man, this is great. Like I, I, I love coming to church. And I got plugged in a couple of months later, started to notice some tension or some dysfunction, specifically among two key individuals. Now the church that I went to, it was a the denomination was Southern Baptist. And so with that, there came a few different unique traditions. Every church is different, but for the church that I went to, one of the traditions that they practice is at the end of the sermon, there would be like a five-minute praise session, but they only use old-school hymns, like traditional hymns, okay? And so we had this lady who went to our church, older lady with her husband. They're from Louisiana, and they relocated to Seattle. Her name was Mrs. Packard, and she would always share a hymn after the message, Now, on the other end, we have our youth pastor. He's pretty much the head pastor of the EM side, okay? And for him, he would preach, and he would oversee everything on the EM. Well, I remember there was a a sermon once where he tried to reach out to our congregation. Our congregation was made up of young believers, seekers, and I think he, he tried to use a lot of illustrations. And so in one of the illustrations he used, he recommended a fictional book, that represented Christianity. I think it was the shack, something along the lines of that, screw tape letters maybe. I, I actually do not remember. But at the end of that message, it was time for Mrs. Packer to go up to sing her hymn. And she did something different that Sunday. Before she started singing the hymn, she took maybe a five-minute kind of uh, talking session before she started. And in her prelude to singing, she said something along the lines of, you know, our generation is just getting worse and worse because we are trying to replace the word of God with other fictional books. And I, 
I just want to encourage you young people out there, don't deviate from the word. Only read the word. And I was like, okay, I guess, I mean, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. The following week, our youth pastor, in the middle of his message, didn't even connect, just dry cut it, inserted this in there, <laughs> said something along the lines of, oh, and speaking of outreach, you know, here's the problem. When you have such an outdated mindset when it comes to outreach, you're never going to reach anyone. You can't just apply principles that were effective in the 1950s and try to apply them in the 2000s. And I was like, oh, this is like a rap battle. Like they're throwing punchlines at each other. So my friend and I back there was like, is that, were they, are they talking about each other? The following weeks, they would just continue to throw shots. And it was the weirdest passive aggressive argument towards each other, but not talking to each other that I had ever seen. I mean, they were talking to the congregation in the middle of service. And at that point, I was like, okay, there's something off here. And then as the weeks continue to roll on, the divisiveness started to affect groups of people. So now you have a camp that is like, yeah, let's stay only, let's only read the word of God. And then you have another camp who's like, but you know, these supplemental teachings can be beneficial. And it started to divide the church. And I remember as a new believer witnessing that, I'm like, whoa, okay, this is, there, there's some major dysfunctional disharmony applications at play here. And so I think my question for you is, have you ever witnessed something like that before? Have you ever been a part of the church that you saw public maybe disharmony? Because it's actually not that uncommon, right? Maybe it wasn't as extreme as my example where they're beefing in the middle of service toward each other. Maybe for you it was a little bit more subtle. Maybe there were uh, disharmony happening between two groups of people on the back end and it wasn't as public. Or maybe you've even dealt with a certain level of dis disharmony internally that is extremely subtle. So some of these things can include, have you ever maybe um, thought of your ministry, the ministry that you're involved in as being somehow better or more effective than other ministries in the church? Because that can be a form of disharmony as well. Maybe for you, um, you went to the church with the intent of serving the body and somewhere along the lines of that, it started to become more self-serving where you really serve to get either affirmation from others or whatever it might be, that is a form of disharmony. Or maybe, and this is probably the most relevant for a lot of us, is have you ever gotten accustomed to only interacting with people who are similar than you, similar to you? So, for example, have you found yourself only interacting with people with a similar upbringing as you, maybe who are in the same place theologically, maybe people who have... Uh, similar tastes in fashion or sports or music or political affiliation. And at the expense of others, you only interact with this small group. And when there's new people coming in or even other parts of the body, you just neglect it because you're like, I'm comfortable with my circle. Well, you know, this can also form a certain sense of disharmony because we're segmenting the church. And so if you're like me, you've experienced some of these either on a small level or a big level. And the reality is the church is made up of people who are different than you. That's just the reality of it. And if we ignore others, this can definitely affect the harmony of the church. And so the awesome thing about the scripture that we're going to be reading today is Paul actually breaks down why we fall into this trap of disharmony. And beyond that, offers a couple of solutions and what we can do proactively to not fall into that. Okay. So all up, today we're going to be breaking down a verse. There's going to be a couple segments there, and then we're going to move into application toward the end. All right, so at this point, if we could all rise, we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 12, verse 16. And the word says this, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or proud, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Okay, let's have a seat. <clears throat> okay, so this is a pretty short verse, right? But there's a lot to unpack. Essentially, Paul is offering four separate charges that we're going to be taking a look at. The first thing that I want to point out is right off the bat, Paul says, do not be proud in light of harmony. We've all been victim of pride before. And in fact, we've given whole messages on pride. Pride is so destructive. 
I feel like it is so cancerous to the body of Christ because it can slip in and sometimes you don't really notice it right away and it can change the way that you view yourself as well as the way you view other people. So for example, having a very prideful mentality when it comes to the body of Christ can look like this. It could look like going to a church with a serve me first mentality. So I only want to go to this church because they have amazing worship. Or the messages here, the preacher here is so good, I only want to go here for that. Or the community here is great, I want to go for that. But the thought never comes out where it's like, hey, how can I use my gifts to help the church, to to collaborate with other people in the body of Christ? That can be a form of pride that can cause this division. Another form of pride is uh, thinking that certain ministries are beneath you. So thinking that, hey, you know what, my skills and gifts are too good, and if this is the only ministry available, like, I'm I'm, I'm not going to do it because I'm too talented for that. That is an extremely toxic form of pride that can manifest itself in the way that we live in, in, in our church body. Another destructive way that pride can manifest itself is in the way that certain people view leaders. Have you ever met anyone who is hypercritical of leaders? whether they be pastors, uh, you know, community group leaders, whatever kind of leaders. I remember the church that I served at, I was on staff part-time in around 2014 or so, and the, the pastor that I was studying under was very transparent with me. He gave me a lot of insight. Sometimes the insight that he gave me was not very encouraging, just some of the things that happens in the church. And I remember there was one email that he showed me And he had blurred out the name, so I didn't know who wrote this. But the gist of the email was, it was like this. The writer said, hey, pastor, you need to work on your messages because they're just not engaging enough. I get bored. Sometimes your, your points don't make sense. You're doing like a million different points and none of them are connected. And the reason you need to change your preaching is because I give to the church. And because I give to the church, I pay your salary. And because I pay your salary, I am a stakeholder in the church. Okay, so now obviously when I read that, I was like, where's the UFC cage at? I mean, it's time to go. You know, that was my sinful anger just bubbling out. I was just like, ooh, I want to choke this guy. But the more I started to calm down and the more I started to understand the context, I started to have sympathy because... The context that the church served was uh, there was a lot of seekers in the church. It was very seeker-friendly. And a lot of people coming into the church were either new believers, were not believers, or were not very mature in their faith. So when I started to understand that, I started to realize, okay, clearly this person doesn't understand that the act of giving is an act of worship between God and the individual. It has nothing to do with the church. This person is applying a business principle to church. Like, that doesn't make sense. And when I dissected it even further, clearly this person had a lot of pride issues in the way that he was critical toward leadership. And that's a type of toxic pride that can really breed disharmony. Proverbs 13.10 says this, Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. So strife and pride occupy the exact same space, and pride is never a good thing. Another thing that pride can do is it can cause us to form individual silos. One unique thing about my generation, the people that I associate with who are on my same life stage, I feel like there is an emphasis on individualism. And this kind of starts early, the messaging. Maybe starting when we're in kindergarten where it's like, hey, you're special, your vision is important, your dreams are important, there's a lot of autonomy preached, you're the center of the universe. And these types of messages can really start to affect the way that people my age live, whether that be in the workforce or, or everyday life. Now, don't get me wrong, not all of it I feel like is bad. For example, there's people that I know who have gladly given up a higher salary or just the pursuit of wealth for something that they really believed in, something that they were passionate about, something that they felt missionally connected to. And I think that's a beautiful characteristic that I don't know how common is with previous generations because my parents' generation were just trying to survive. So there wasn't really that much of an opportunity to do that. I think where it can become an issue is if we 
get so wrapped up in this individualistic mentality. And look, I, I dealt with it too when I was in music because I just felt like no one really understood the work that I did. And so naturally, you're just kind of in your own little bubble. But when we take that and apply it to the church and we start to operate in silos, the Bible never teaches us that we need to operate in silos within the body of Christ because that can ultimately cause a level of disharmony. Pastor Joe mentioned this last week in his message. He, he said that if your approach to, to church is just slipping in on Sundays and then leaving immediately after without ever connecting with the body, is that really living in the body of Christ? Is that really doing church together? Is that really harmony within the church? And I think that's really relevant. The second thing that having a hyper-individualistic mentality can do if we're not careful is it can form a me-against-the-world mentality. So for people that I've interacted with, there seems to be a higher propensity for them to take things offensively if someone disagrees with them. So you're so trapped into your vision and you believe in it so passionately and then the second someone offers a differing opinion, then it's like, okay, shots fired, let's go. Like it's, it's, time, it's time to go to war with this person. And the dangerous thing about that is if that's taken to the extreme, everyone who disagrees with you might be seen as the enemy. And here's the reality. Within the body of Christ, there's so many different opinions on certain things that are non-critical. And it's okay to have different opinions, and you shouldn't take them so offensively. For example, I remember in 2017, Rochelle and I took a trip to Korea. I had just gotten in contact with my biological mother, and we were going to meet her in Korea. But since it was my first trip going to Asia, we made a pit stop in Hong Kong to visit Rochelle's grandmother. And on the flight, I remember coming down the hallway or, or the alleyway, I saw someone that I recognized. And it was my friend. So I was like, hey, are you, are you going to Asia? He was like, yeah, I'm going to Hong Kong for like two weeks. And so I said, hey, let's connect when we get there. Let's get dessert or something. So we ended up connecting. And it was a good time. He was with his wife. We talked about travel styles. At the time, Rochelle and I were just getting adjusted to traveling together. We had different upbringings with that. And I remember in that conversation, I shared that my travel style is kind of uh, maybe particular. I don't know how many people in here could relate to it. But before I go traveling, I normally create a list of things that I would like to visit, like must visits. And then while we're there, I can maybe do one or two excursions a day and I'm tapped out. Like I have to go back and rest or else it's like too much for me. And then for my friend and his wife, for them, they like to travel in a way that every part of their schedule is completely booked. And there's like maybe 15 minute buffers or 10 minute buffers in between. And obviously when I heard that, I was like, wow, if I ever try to travel like that, I would just feel like this isn't even a vacation. Like this is too much. It's like quantity over quality. I tapped out at the second excursion. But if my friend tried to adopt my travel style for him, he might be like, man, are you even on vacation? Like, you could just rest at home. Like, we're only here for a limited amount of time. We gotta try to get the most out of this. And so these different type of opinions are okay. And just because someone has a different opinion than you, we must be careful to not let that breed disharmony within the body. James 4, 6 says, but he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So to exercise harmony, we must lead with humility. Okay, so Paul just taught us, don't be proud. The next charge, the second charge he gives us in the scripture is associate with the lowly. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, what does that mean to associate with the lowly? Who are the lowly? The lowly are people who might have uh, less than you do. Maybe they're not in the same social standing as you. Maybe they are less educated. Maybe they are plagued with more sin than you. Um, I think an easy way of thinking about this is people who might not be able to offer you anything in return for your help. And Paul is commissioning us, commanding us to interact with the lowly. And I think it's important because in a lot of ways, this is admitting that not everyone is like us. And when we, dis when we associate with people who are low, this can really help us to become less prideful. I have friends who are artists in my time doing music who are comedians, entertainers, some of them even church planners. And I think um, we've had so many conversations about this throughout the years, but the conclusion we landed on is it is almost impossible to do anything creative 
in 2021 without having some type of social media digital footprint for you to brand yourself with. It's just a nature of the beast. I'm not a fan of social media, but I have one for music to promote it. And so I remember we would have these conversations and I started noticing this weird trend when we would tour. You would think that if someone is talented at a certain level, that they would naturally wanna collaborate with other people who are on the same level to make good art together, right? That makes sense. But <clears throat> that was actually never the case. What I really saw was Artists would only work with other artists who are either at the same place when it comes to reach or maybe a little bit above. But if you're lower, they probably will not work with you. So I started seeing all these collaborations between people that I'm like, whoa, this is like the quality of music is like completely different, but then the reach is similar, and that was weird. And essentially what Paul is describing here is to do the exact opposite of that to interact with the lowly as a remedy to our pride. Because ultimately, if we think about it, we are lowly compared to God. And yet Christ died for our sins and interacts with us and saves us. I love these two verses here. Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. And you know this verse from 1 Corinthians these verses. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. What a powerful reminder this is. I love those verses. The third charge that Paul teaches us is do not be wise in your own sight. So the NIV actually phrases this as do not be conceited. And this command is pretty straightforward, but it's still equally important. Don't think you're the most wise, witty, intelligent, because if you fall into that trap, what you're really doing is you're preventing yourself from ever growing anymore. Because this goes back to fueling pride. It's the complete opposite of of, of harmony. You know, when we look at the Bible, there are certain groups. There's one subgroup in particular that illustrates this perfectly. In any given situation, they were seen as the most wise. They had the most scripture memorized. They always sat at the most honorable positions during banquets. But on the back end, they weren't really living the way that they were preaching. And these people were the Pharisees. And I think this is a warning for us to not fall into the trap of being a Pharisee. And this is personal. I had a conversation with a friend who is going through a faith crisis in his life right now where he got accustomed to going to church. He knew all the right answers. I think by all accounts, if you didn't know him and you asked him a question, you would say that his answer is pretty wise, pretty biblical, pretty, pretty structurally um, sound. And recently he started to admit to me that, you know, he's not even sure if he believes in God and that he has these scriptures or these principles memorized and he's always been able to share them because he really likes the idea of people thinking that he's wise. He got affirmation from targeting either new believers or believers who are struggling through difficult situations. And this idea that he could just expound wisdom to them made him feel really good about himself. It was never really about God. And that's such a dangerous thing to fall into. Don't be wise in your own sight. Now, I want to clarify, I, this does not mean don't strive to be wise. This does not mean don't live wisely. We're just mainly talking about not thinking that you're the wisest person in the room just because you know the answer or whatever else, because that can really breed pride. I feel like, if anything, true wisdom is knowing that you're not the wisest and also knowing that you can learn from any and everyone. You're a student to everyone. God could use anyone to teach you something. I think that's what true wisdom is. Proverbs 11.2 says this, When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. The fourth charge by Paul, which is technically the first in order, I just wanted to save this for the end, was to live in harmony with one another. So at this point in the message, we've covered a lot about what it looks like to live in harmony with one another. But I think for me, what hit home the most was not excluding other people just because they're different than you. You know, I grew up in the city, and 
Um, I grew up with my grandmother. I think I've shared elements of this before. At age seven, my parents moved to the suburbs. And they wanted me to go to school in the suburbs um, because they thought that the schools in Seattle were pretty dangerous. And so as a kid, I don't really have an option. I just have to do it. So I remember during the weekdays, I would go to school in the suburbs. And then on the weekends, I would come back and spend time with my grandmother. And probably within the first three to four months, I started to notice that um, these two groups of people were very different. Like my friends who grew up in the city, I felt like are maybe a little bit more cultured, maybe on top of uh, trends or whatever else. And my friends who grew up in the suburbs, maybe a little bit more sheltered, not all of them, but you know, enough. And, but they all had unique, lovable qualities about both. And I really enjoyed that. In the very beginning of the message, I shared about how it was like to enter a church for a non-believer, how I felt so welcomed. After I came to know the Lord, I wanted to do the same thing for other new believers who came into the church. And so I remember I connected with this guy one time. I don't know why I felt compelled to connect with him. He was just a new visitor on like a Friday night Bible study because we couldn't be more different than each other. But I felt compelled to reach out to him. So you could go right down the list of how different we are. I mean, just on the most surface level, I'm a believer. He's a seeker. We have different ethnic backgrounds. He was more into academics. I was more into music or creating arts. Uh, I was more into flag football. He was more into this Canadian thing called curling, even though he's not Canadian. Uh, but he played it with the, with the brooms. And I remember he was way more public than I was. I was more private. Anyways, you go right down the list and you could just see all the differences. But for whatever reason, when we connected, we just had this really good rapport where we were able to connect. And he was able to go beneath the surface. He didn't take himself too seriously. And through connecting with him, he eventually came to know the Lord. And even now to this day, we still keep in touch. I remember after Rochelle and I got married, we went to New York for the first time because that's where he lived for a long time. He, um, because he went to college out there at Columbia. And First time we went there, he just showed us around everywhere. He's still thriving in his faith, and we still connect. And I feel like without having that type of connection and having that type of conviction to reach out to someone who's different, we may have never formed that type of a bond. And I think that's really beautiful. Living in harmony means having a united shared vision. I really like this verse here. Romans 15.5 says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. That's what God commands us to do. All right, so I told you that in the beginning we would break down kind of the charges within the verse, which we just did. At this point, we're going to move over to a couple practical applications. There's essentially four of them that I would like to share with you that have helped me a lot and that I've witnessed that was really beneficial. The first takeaway that you can apply as early as today when you get home, is if you felt convicted during the message when it comes to pride, or if you realize that, oh, you know what, I, I, I might have some prideful tendencies, I think there's no greater place to start than coming before God, spending time in prayer, and asking for humility, repenting of pride, asking God to, asking God to help you have a better heart full of humility towards others. Because God really does not like the proud. This is a really, really important place to start. The second thing that I feel like is a very practical thing that you can do next month is getting plugged into a community group. You know, when I was connected to a community group at my other church, I'll tell you this. There's no greater way to connect with people who are different than you than in a community group, in a CG, right? So... We had this uh, system in place at my old church where they would have 18-month cycles. So we would form the group in January. We would go for a year and a half until the following July in the summertime, June, July. And then we would take six months off, and then there would be like a big church kickoff event in December. And then we would start new small groups all or community groups all over again in January. And... At first, it was a little bit challenging, but I think the heart behind it was to prevent kind of these country club silos that have been together for decades without ever inviting people in um, to expand and to connect with other parts of the body. And it was challenging. It was really difficult sometimes because we connected with people 
that we're just so different, or even other times we get so ripe in our deepness, and then all of a sudden we had a, you know, disband, and we still keep in touch, but it's, it's a little bit different. But I think if you're not plugged into a community group, a CG right now, the awesome thing is that in January there are sign-ups, and if you're interested, reach out to Pastor Daryl. This is a plug for him so that you can get plugged in with us. We have some groups who meet online exclusively, some groups who meet in person. There's a hybrid. So there's many options for you if you're not currently plugged in. The third practical thing that you can do to foster harmony is joining a ministry. If you're not currently serving in the body, we have so many different opportunities for you to serve. I remember that before Rochelle and I got married, she served on worship. And after we got married, she felt that God wanted her to minister to the threes and fours of rock ministry. And so I would come in with her early on Sundays to set up the, the panels and get everything situated. And then after service, I would go in and help tear down and break down. And sometimes I'll walk in, you know, to like Baby Shark or whatever. And then sometimes I'm, I'm observing and I'm like, wow, they are so gifted at this because I would be terrible if I, if I try to do this. I'm just not gifted in that way. Um, but serving in different ministries allows you to see different parts of the body. Or maybe you've been serving in a certain ministry for a while and you want to try something new. This is a really practical thing that you can try out. The last practical step that you can apply today is to encourage someone. Encourage a part of the body that you're blessed by or that you've noticed is amazing. This is so easy. I mean, it can be as simple as hey, I really like the way that you prayed for me that time. It, it really touched me. It was really helpful for me. And I was just struggling through a pretty dark season. It could be as simple as, hey, that worship set the other day, that was amazing. I really love how you tied in all the songs with the message. And it was just one cohesive experience. I was able to experience God in a deep way that time. Or it could be something like, hey, uh, I love the you know, when we're meeting at the Lake Hills, it was, I love the food that you make, or I really appreciate you waking up at like six in the morning to help set up for us so that we can even have a worship service. I really appreciate your word. There's so many different ways to encourage, and this can really foster a sense of harmony. Now, truth be told, I've been to maybe two other churches in my life, and I will say that Cornerstone, completely unbiased, really, really good at encouragement. I feel like this is something that Rochelle and I say a lot to each other, like, wow, Cornerstone is so encouraging. So this is a really good thing that you can practice in light of harmony within the church. Okay, so at this time, I'd like to call up the music team as we transition over to musical worship. And before we do that, I want to conclude with a few different uh, thoughts. And first thing is, as we continue to grow and draw others closer to Christ, let's continue to embrace the harmony within our church. Like, I really do believe that Everyone is gifted with a specific talent, with a um, skill set, and that is just so different and unique to you that if we embrace the differences and really partner together as a body, there's no telling to how we can reach out to our community. Um, I really feel like it's, it's limitless. So let's continue to strive to, to, to reach the city for God. Okay, well, at this time, I'd like to close this off in a word of prayer, but before we do that, can we all rise? Just as a reminder, if you need prayer for anything or if you just want to encourage one of our intercessors or if you have a request, uh, please do not hesitate to approach one of the prayer intercessors here up front for prayer during musical worship. It's a really good time for you to seek, seek help or seek wisdom or whatever that might be. Also, this is a really good time for us to give as an act of worship to God, whether online or in person. Let me go ahead and pray as we transition to musical worship. Father, we're grateful. We're grateful for your provision. We're grateful for your love. We're grateful that you have designed all of us uniquely with specific talents. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live in a way where humility is present, where we don't think of our giftings or abilities as higher than others, but rather that we are a piece of the puzzle to the body of Christ. May we continue to love each other in a harmonious way, to encourage one another, to, to move forward. Help us to not see ourselves through the lens of pride, Lord. Um, we're just grateful that you 
love us, that you interact with us, even though we are so lowly compared to you. There's something about us that you just love, and we're so grateful for your mercy. Lord, help us to remember who we're celebrating during this season, and we're just so grateful for you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.